be uh, Michael Green, um, a physician and uh, bioethicist at the Penn State University uh, Milton Hershey uh, Medical Center. He's chair of the Hospital uh, Ethics Committee and director of the program in bioethics there. Um, in his current position, um, uh, he's, uh, 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 he cares for patients, teaches medical students and residents, conducts research in bioethics. Um, his research has most recently focused on helping patients uh, to make informed decisions with the help of interactive computer-based decision aids, and that's what he's going to be talking to us about uh, today. So to the podium, uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you much. It's great to be back here in Chicago at the McLean Center. Um, I want to just start by acknowledging uh, my collaborators on this research as well as funding that we received from the um, NIH as well as the American Cancer Society. Um, as everyone in this audience knows, planning for the future is really quite important. And when people don't plan for the future, all sorts of bad things can happen to people, including uh, the receipt of unwanted treatment, uh, unnecessary costs that result from that. People have suffered needlessly. There's burdens to family members and even contentious battles between family members. Uh, and so we advocate that people fill out advanced directives, uh, but we all know that advanced directives have serious limitations and have been shown in many studies not to accomplish many of the goals that they were intended to accomplish. And they often just don't, they often don't work. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, only about a quarter of adults uh, tend to fill out advanced directives, uh, that physicians hesitate to have discussions with patients about these issues because of a lot of reasons, uh, including uh, the fact that having these discussions are time consuming, and they worry that patients lack the knowledge to make sufficiently informed decisions to be meaningful. Uh, and particularly in the oncology community, but not only there, there's worry that having these kinds of discussions can diminish hope and increase patients' anxiety so they avoid having the discussions. Now, now the alternative to having advanced care planning discussions, of course, is to rely on surrogates to decide, and we just learned something about how they go about doing that, uh, but relying on surrogates to make these decisions is problematic. Studies have shown that others can accurately predict patients' wishes only about two-thirds of the time and often get it entirely wrong. So we need a new and better way to have uh, advanced care planning kinds of encounters. And this led us to develop an interactive computer program to fill in some of these gaps and address some of the limitations. So we've been working on this for almost a decade now. Uh, the program we developed is an online decision aid. It's called Making Your Wishes Known, Planning Your Medical Future. It was designed over many years with an interdisciplinary group of physicians and nurses and geriatricians and graphic artists and decision analysts, and it's very educational. Uh, the program uh, is designed to help people choose a surrogate decision maker. It helps them explore their values and preferences, learn about their medical options and articulate their wishes and discuss and reflect upon uh, their choices uh, in a way that's meaningful. Uh, the program includes clinical vignettes and patient testimonials, uh, example of which is shown here. And perhaps the most innovative aspect of the program is the use of a decision aid that helps people to explore their values. This is based on something called multi-attribute utility theory, and it prompts users to, ask, uh, to answer a variety of different questions about their goals and values and preferences, and then it uses the answers to rank uh, and rate the importance of various things for their decision making, and then the computer generates a set of uh, um, directives that is consistent logically with what people say is important to them. And then the people have an opportunity to say, well, the computer got it wrong or they got it right, but at least it's a starting point for figuring out what it is that they would want. Uh, and the program is very educationally oriented. It's sort of designed to emulate what an ideal encounter between a doctor and a patient would be in a world where doctors had unlimited time and lots of knowledge, which uh, they often don't. So, so the question arises, of course, is, you know, is this effective? Does, does the thing work? Uh, and we've done a number of studies uh, now to try to answer that question. Uh, some of the earlier work we did was using this program with a set of medical students. We did a randomized controlled trial uh, with a class of 150 medical students where half of them used 
our computer program, half of them used a standard set of advanced care planning tools, and we measured a bunch of outcomes, and uh, those randomly assigned to the intervention group outperformed the other group across all, uh, all outcomes that we looked at. We also done a variety of feasibility studies with all these different groups of people outlined here, uh, and we found that uh, the satisfaction with the computer program was quite high on a scale of one to five. They were very satisfied with how it increased their knowledge, provided information, clarified their values, helped them make decisions, put their wishes into words, helped them be prepared to have discussions uh, with families and doctors. Uh, and overall, satisfaction scores were high. They rated that the uh, program was very accurate at representing their wishes and was little to no burden. Uh, we also did some reliability studies, uh, one of which involved uh, 24 people uh, who completed the program twice, uh, separated by four to six weeks. And uh, we looked at three different aspects of reliability, and there was perfect correlation in terms of the general wishes that the program uh, reflected, but there was much less correlation with very specific wishes about treatment options that they would want or not want, and it was sort of in the middle with regard to quality of life issues. Um, and all this is sort of a preamble to what I really wanted to talk to you about, which is the results of uh, some research that we did in an American Cancer Society study, uh, which uh, was a randomized controlled trial of making your wishes known versus standard advanced care planning materials uh, among patients who had advanced cancer. And these are people who had life expectancies less than two years uh, and were not depressed. And uh, we had uh, hypothesized uh, that compared to standard advanced care planning, use of the computer program uh, with patients who had advanced cancer would result in greater knowledge without a decline in hope or an increase in anxiety uh, and greater sense of self-determination as well as greater satisfaction. And we looked at pre and post uh, as well as between group changes in, in these outcomes here, knowledge, hope, hopelessness, anxiety, and self-determination. You know, and, and one of the reasons for this hope and anxiety is what I said before about uh, physicians often using that as a rationale for not having the discussions. And nobody actually had, had looked empirically at, at whether these discussions had an impact on hope and anxiety. And then post-intervention, uh, we looked at satisfaction. So the intervention group used our computer program. Uh, the control group used educational materials uh, and a standard living will form uh, that we actually chose from among the best uh, in the country as rated by um, uh, the, uh, uh, dying, the report on dying in America. And, uh, and then we did some statistical analyses, uh, which I won't get into. Um, but th this is sort of the, the flow chart of of the study, and one of the interesting things about it is that doing this kind of research with very ill patients is really quite challenging. And we recruit, uh, we randomize 200 people into the study, and in order to get 200 participants, we started with 2,000 referrals. And that's just what it, what it takes to do this research. It's very labor intensive and time consuming, um, and that's, that's what it took. And then we randomized uh, 100 in each group, and we had almost everyone complete the project. Now, we're not done yet. We, we, we're actually following all these people until death, um, and then we're gonna do all, all sorts of um, measures after patient, patients die in terms of what, what it is uh, that they received in terms of medical care, and whether their wishes were followed, and what the doctors knew, and, and all that. But only about half of the patients have died so far, so we've got a couple more years uh, to follow these people. Uh, so we're going to report on some more short-term outcomes. But what we found is of the 200 people who were enrolled, uh, mean age was 60, most were male, white, and uh, computer literate, and there was no difference between the groups. Uh, in terms of knowledge, uh, we had a 27 item uh, uh, knowledge test. Uh, they got about half of the questions right at baseline. After uh, using the decision aid, as well as the uh, other materials, their knowledge increased in a statistically significant manner, but the change in knowledge was uh, significantly greater in the decision aid group than it was in the standard group. 
Anxiety was surprisingly low at baseline for both groups. Despite the fact that these people had severe illness and had a very poor prognosis, their baseline not, uh, level of anxiety was, 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 was low. And after engaging in advanced care planning uh, discussions in either group, uh, the anxiety did not go up. In fact, it went down uh, a, a bit in the uh, decision aid group, it stayed the same in the standard group. And the change in anxiety was uh, greater in the decision aid group than in the standard group. Hopefulness. Uh, despite being very ill, uh, people had pretty high levels of hope uh, at baseline, and their hopefulness did not change after engaging in these very difficult discussions about their end-of-life wishes, as we had hypothesized. And there was no difference between the groups. We also looked at hopelessness, which is a similar construct to hopefulness, uh, and people did not have a lot of hopelessness, which is good, and it didn't uh, change after having these conversations in either group. Self-determination was looking at how much people felt empowered to affect the kind of treatments that they would receive uh, at the end of life, and people uh, felt moderately uh, self-determined, and it went up in a statistically significant manner after either intervention, whether that's clinically significant, I'm not quite sure, but it did go up. And the uh, change in self-determination scores is no difference between the groups. And then we looked at satisfaction with the advanced care planning method that they engaged in, and we found that they were more satisfied in the decision aid group than in the standard group, and that was statistically significant. Uh, these results did not, uh, were not affected by age or gender or self-reported health, or prior computer use, or prior completion of advanced directive, or their performance status. And so, you know, despite the fact that this has some limitations, I mean, this is only one study site, it's a, a population of limited ethnic diversity. There are many people who declined participation, and unfortunately we don't know if their wishes are different than the people who did participate. And this is a narrow set of outcomes, despite this, uh, we have some conclusions uh, that compared to standard advanced care planning, patients with advanced cancer who use the decision aid have greater increases in knowledge, no adverse changes in anxiety and hope. They express greater self-determination and are more satisfied. And in ongoing research, we want to continue to investigate this population to see whether use of the decision aid actually has an impact on the medical care that people receive at the end of life, which is really what, what matters, and whether it increases the likelihood that their wishes are known by their physicians as well as followed. Uh, and then I'm also pleased that uh, we just got a uh, five-year R01 uh, grant from the NIH to study the impact of this decision aid on family caregivers, uh, and we'll be doing that um, over the next number of years. If you're interested in checking this out, you can find the program online. It's uh, at uh, www.makingyourwishesknown.com. Uh, and I will stop there and take questions later. Thank <laughs> you.